we want to organize on the new urban agenda. As you know, the Paris Climate Agreement came into force very recently on the 4th of November, and the uh, parties will meet again next week in Marrakesh at COP22. We are happy that cities and local governments now are a pretty integral part of the climate talks. And in addition, IPCC, with the Government of Panel, Panel on Climate Change, uh, will give a special focus to cities uh, in, a, in a report, and they are now in uh, scoping processes. So we are in a very good space to, to talk about these issues and to influence the agenda moving forward. So today's webinar will link uh, air quality and climate change, and we will talk about why cities should indeed do this by thinking globally and acting locally. We will see examples of how our cities can maximize air, human health, and climate for benefits. So this is the first webinar of three, as mentioned. And this one will introduce the linkages between the urban air quality management aspects and climate change. And it will showcase national and city level solutions to improve urban air quality and reduce emissions, in particular of those emissions that are living for a short period of time in the atmosphere, the short-lived climate pollutants across different sectors, including transport and waste. You see in front of you a slide where it says, breathe life, clean air, healthy future. And we wanted to use this opportunity to ask you to actually join us in breathing life back into our cities through a campaign that we are organizing together with the World Health Organization and also in collaboration with the UN Environment. So take note of that uh, website URL and please visit after, after the webinar is over. So I would also like to ask all uh, registered in the webinar if we can add your names, your email addresses to the Breed Light database and reach out to you related to the campaign. If you prefer not to, just let us know and, and, and we will give you your name. This webinar is recorded and will be made available on our website of the Climate and Clean Air Foundation. So let's move now on to our panelists. First, we have Dr. Gary Hack. He's the Senior Research Associate at Stockholm's Environment Institute. And he has um, over 15 years of experience of supporting the development and implementation of air pollution, transport, climate change policy in Africa, Asia, and Europe. His work has been involved, uh, he has been involved in providing evidence base to support policy formulation. He actually went with, uh, with the support from the Climate Engineering Coalition just uh, recently to to, to give a similar talk to metropolis mega cities in the city of Mashhad in Iran. His uh, bio will be available also on the website. So over to you, Dr. Gary Hack. Hello. Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to you all, and welcome to this seminar. The title of my presentation is Urban Air Pollution and Climate Change. And the objective really here is to give you a kind of introduction to the issue of air pollution and climate change that will help for uh, the following seminars, which will look at much more detail, in much more detail, the local action of which cities can take to address air pollution and climate change. What I would like to do is discuss in this presentation the air pollution challenge, the driving forces of urban air pollution, uh, the pressure it puts on the urban environment, how it affects environmental quality, the impact and the response we are taking. And the second uh, presentation will look at in much more detail the actions taken at the city level to improve air quality and climate change. And finally, uh, conclusion. As you probably all know already, um, the air pollution challenge is not just a global issue, not just a local issue, but also a global issue. It has an impact from the local to the global level at, dif at different scales. For example, in, at the local level, we have uh, indoor air pollution, mainly due from open cooking. At the urban scale, we have uh, transport pollution. At the peri-urban scale, we have the issue of uh, agricultural burning. 
at the regional scale, we have the issue of forest fires and acid rain, acidification. And at the global level, we have greenhouse gases and the contribution that makes to global warming and climate change. So the air pollution challenge is really a, lo local, a local issue, but also a global issue. And many sources of uh, air pollution are at the local level. And this has been a problem because we've now seen that many cities are growing very rapidly and is causing a number, there's been a number of driving forces that are affecting the state of the air that we breathe. The key driving forces have been urbanization, motorization and industrialization. As you can see over the uh, over a period, we've seen a massive urbanization in 2015. There was 29 megacities. Megacities are urban agglomerations of more than 10 million people. This is expected to increase to 41 by 2030. And most of these megacities are in Asia. At the same time, we're having increased motorization, which is also an issue for greenhouse gas emissions from the transport sector, as well as industrialization and the burning of fossil fuels and industrial processes. So these uh, <coughs> three driving forces are uh, occurring at a scale and a rate much greater than we've seen in the past, for example, in cities that um, enter the Industrial Revolution. They may have, uh, have a, may have to deal with urbanization or pollution, but not the co all combined together. So urbanization, motorization, industrialization, the scale and the speed are overwhelming the resilience of the urban ecosystem and placing the pressure in terms of the pollution that, and the emissions that they create. So if you look at the kind of uh, pressures from air pollutant emissions, we see they come from different areas. We, all, we have stationary sources, industry, power plants, sewage treatment. We have mobile sources, which we know is a key factor, uh, transport sector, cars, truck buses, as well as agricultural sector, livestock and fertilizer, as well as also natural uh, emissions, such as volcanoes, wild wildfires and lightning, etc. So all these uh, sources of pollution are, in, are causing and affecting uh, the air that we breathe in, and also the pollutants that are emitted. These range from nitrogen oxide, sulfur dioxide, carbon monoxide, and, carb and carbon dioxide, as well as a secondary pollutant such as ozone, which is a uh, produced by a number of pollutants in the presence of sunlight. In addition, we have particulate matter. These are small fine particles of different sizes which are deleterious to human health and are able to, be, to breathe into the lungs. And these range from PM10, PM2.5, ultrafine particles. And especially PM2.5 are made up of black carbon and coal pollutants such as organic carbon and sulfate. Now to illustrate this point, we, I would like to focus on the particulate matter because these are the most damaging to human health. Just to give you an idea of well, when we talk about the, the size, here you can see on uh, human air and if you look, the blue small uh, balls there are the size of PM10 which is equivalent to a dust of pollen and then even smaller is PM2.5 and these are uh, com combustion particles, organic compounds and we breathe in these particles into, um, into our lungs which has an impact on our health, especially the most uh, vulnerable sector of our society such as young children, older people and people with particular um, pulmonary diseases. So we have the kind of uh, the air pollutants, but in addition, we have also what we call short-lived climate pollutants. And these are pollutants that not only have an impact at the local level in terms of effects on human health, but also 
at the global level in terms of their contribution to climate change. And these short-lived climate pollutants include black carbon, as I just mentioned, and these come from diesel, incomplete combustion, uh, biofuel burning, coal and brick kilns, and open burning. And they absorb heat in the atmosphere uh, which contributes to the effects of climate change. They're normally in the atmosphere for a few days and have local and regional impacts but also contribute to global impacts. The second is methane which is mainly from agriculture and these are and waste and these uh, live in the atmosphere for at least 12 years and have a greater impact but also is a contribution they contribute, they're a precursor to tropospheric ozone. Tropospheric ozone, again, is a mixture of different uh, pollutants in the presence of sunlight. They have a local impact as well as a regional impact. And then the, th the fourth one is hydrofluorocarbons. And these are mainly used for, to replace ozone-depleting substances in air conditioning, refrigeration, etc and these have a mainly global impact uh, 15 years. So we have, when it comes to the emissions of air pollution, there's a number of uh, pollutants which have a direct impact on human health, which we've considered in the past when we talked about um, how we address urban air quality at the local level, but now we've noticed that there are some pollutants that also have a global impact, and by a and each of both these pollutants are affecting the state of the urban environment. So, as I said, uh, one, of the, one of the key aspects of climate change is greenhouse gas and greenhouse gas emissions. And we've seen that the atmospheric concentrations of Greek carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrogen oxide have been unprecedented in the last uh, 1800 uh, last years. And also, greenhouse gases has in, been increased mainly due to the industrial drive, these driving forces of economic growth and population growth. Next is the emissions of PM2.5. A recent report by WHO has suggested that 92% of the world's population now live in places where air quality levels exceed WHO ambient air quality guidelines for PM2.5. And most of the air pollution related deaths are occurring in low and middle income countries with two out of three occurring in Southeast Asia and Western Pacific regions. So if you look at this map, which is for 2013 on Avril average PM 2.5, and the red area you see, it's mainly Southeast Asia and the Western Pacific. You see India, China. So these are the areas where, which are being affected by these air pollutants. So we have driving forces, which are creating a pressure on on the urban environment affecting environmental quality. And these, this pressure is not only in terms of uh, effects on urban air quality, but also contributes to, a, has a much more global impact. And unfortunately, this is an, another report by OECD, which estimate on the, the global emissions of these pollutants in the future. And as you can see here, we have black carbon, we have nitrogen oxide increasing and ammonia as well. So the most pollutant emissions are projected to increase over the coming decades, especially nitrogen oxide, ammonia, and this is mainly due to agriculture uh, energy in terms of transport and power generation. So uh, this is all affecting this, the, the air that we breathe, which is having an impact on human health and well-being. Globally, around 4 million uh, premature deaths are being estimated to be due to ambient air pollution. And again, which goes back with the other, rep the other map that I just showed you, the Western Pacific and Southeast Asia are suffering the most from this impact with uh, 1.6 million 
deaths and 900, 936,000 deaths for the Southeast Asian region. And the impact is mainly down to um, on human health, PM2.5. If you see the kind of health effects it, that it has on the human body, it affects uh, pul pulmonary disease, childhood pneumonia, heart disease, stroke, as well as asthma, breathing problems, airway inflammation, chronic respiratory illness, reduced lung function, as well as low birth weight. And this map just shows you again, Western Pacific and Southeast East Asia are suffering the most from the impact of the urban, urban air pollution. Obviously, this impact on human health is having a cost in terms of welfare losses. And again, this is a recent report by World Bank, which has estimated that exposure to air pollution, both outdoor and indoor air pollution, costs the world's economy about five trillion dollars uh, in welfare losses. Uh, the biggest loss is East Asia, South Asia, the Pacific, which is equivalent to around seven to seven point five percent of the GDP. So this is affecting the urban air quality, but at the same time we, we are also exper um, experiencing the impact of climate change and this is again having an impact at the urban level. So the kind of impacts that we've experienced is a decrease in cold temperature, extremes, warm temperature, uh, sea level rise, uh, heavy precipitation and again the continued emission of greenhouse gases will cause further warming and change to the climate system. So we've seen that we have the driving forces, motorization, industrialization and urbanization. These are affecting, causing the emissions of particular pollutants that are affecting the state of uh, the urban environment in terms of our health. I haven't spoken here about the the environmental effects and the effects on uh, you know, agriculture, the effects on buildings and materials which are also affected by um, air pollution because I don't have that much time. But it's also having an impact on the quality of life which, has, a, which has an economic impact. So how do we deal with all these different uh, issues to address and improve the air that we breathe? As uh, we heard earlier, a number of international initiatives have, now, have uh, been taken recently which provides the impetus for cities to really take action to, 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 uh, to address urban air pollution and climate change. This has uh, been the Paris Agreement which we're trying to keep global temperature rise uh, to 1.5 but well below 2 degrees. The um, Habitat 3 the new urban agenda which again is promoting a cleaner cities, having cities to be much more resilient to the risks and impacts of disasters as well, in, as well as making a contribution to taking action on climate change and the sustainable development goals which, want, which aims to improve the, you know, good health and well-being, sustainable cities, uh, consumption and climate action. This framework or these frameworks together, these new agendas with the uh, provide, uh, help and enable cities to now to re to take action on urban air pollution and climate change and to link the two issues together and for me what's been interesting over the past 10 years is that there was a time when urban air quality although it was still a problem it was not there high on the political agenda climate change came along now what's interesting to see and is that we can, we're able now to link both urban air quality and climate change and how we can um, take action to, in a, and take a much more holistic approach to, in, to addressing these two key issues because ultimately the sources of, air pollution, of the air pollution, the air emissions are the same at the local level. Now w one of the key ways that I've been, we've been doing this is um, by developing air quality management systems and these are a collection of strategies designed to eliminate or reduce ambient air pollution concentrations to reduce the effects on human health and the environment and to prevent material damage and economic loss. Uh, they consist of 
emission inventories, air pollution modeling, air quality monitoring and control measures. And they're normally presented in a clean air action plan which is implemented at the city level. The kind of city level action that that can be taken include, for example, promoting cleaner homes, much more energy efficient homes, reducing the impact of open burning, as well as making cars, trucks and buses cleaner, especially the, the local fleets of the city authorities, promoting cleaner businesses in terms of reducing industrial emissions and better management practice, business management practice and most importantly providing an alternative to the car use in terms of um, cleaner integrated public transport and better public transport integrated with better uh, land use planning. So these are the kind of actions and that have been taken at the city level and how they've responded to the challenge both of urban air pollution and climate change. And the reason why it's important and why I guess we're giving this, this these three seminars is really to highlight the benefits that can be gained by taking local action as well as thinking globally. As we, by concentrating on these short-lived climate pollutants such as black carbon, methane and ozone, we're able to um, have the potential to slow down warming by 2050 by as much as 0.6 degrees Celsius. So this um, has a, has a benefit of avoiding warming in terms of reduced sea level rise, um, ice melting, improving health by avoiding premature deaths from outdoor air pollution, and also reducing the impact on agri agriculture and crops. So, and these are the co-benefits. So I started off by uh, my presentation saying acting locally, thinking globally. It's clear that some of the actions that we can take to improve the state of the air that we breathe at the urban level also now has the potential to reduce uh, the impact of global warming and climate change and, the, and, to, and we can gain these multiple benefits by um, looking at different strategies that we can take to achieve uh, and improve uh, both the, the local and the global climate. So in conclusion, this has just been a very quick brief overview of the issue and because uh, of the, we don't have that much time, but I'd just like to say that the Paris Agreement, the new urban agenda and the sustainable development goals provide the international framework now for air and climate action in cities. Now you can say, well, we, we know this, we, you know, the problems have been there, but I think what's different is that there's a new impetus to try and address these issues together and I think this also provides for some city authorities, authorities the, um, the reason why they should take action and, and, and justify taking action to their local policy makers as well as the citizens. Secondly, as we know there's a need to improve both urban air quality and reduce climate change in the near term as well as the long term that the emissions of short-lived climate pollutants have effect on health and the environment. I've only spoken about the health effects here but we know on agriculture, on um, buildings and materials it has an impact as well and natural ecosystems. And finally taking local actions to address both these short-term pollutants such as methane, black carbon, uh, tropospheric ozone uh, can, can also have uh, multiple co-benefits that improves the air that we breathe but also protects the, the climate that in which we live and uh, are affected by. So that is the end of my presentation. Um, I hope you're still listening and I thank you for your attention and remember this is just the first of three presentations and the, uh, the second presentation will be in a few weeks where we look at much more in much more detail and the second present but the second present second presentation today will be looking at the different uh, examples of city action what's been taken to reduce uh, climate change and improve urban air quality at the local level thank you so thank you very much, uh, thank you very much, 
very high. Um, before we move on to our second uh, presenter and speaker today, which is Marit de van Staden of ICLE, we have uh, at least one question from a panelist, and please take the chance to, to ask your questions, raise your hand, or type in your question in the little chat room. And I will read up what's there now. It's for you, Gary. Uh, as a result of the Wali Festival, where millions of firecrackers were burned, our capital city, Delhi, is having 900 plus PM, which extreme, is extremely harmful to every people out there. Is there any immediate solution for it? Firecrackers. Gary, over to you. Hello. Thank you for your question. I guess I've read about this issue within uh, in the newspapers. I think um, this is an issue because also it has if you think about it, kind of uh, cultural aspects of it. In the UK, for example, at this moment, we're also, we celebrated last week, November the 5th, bonfire night, where we also have uh, firework displays. And the question is, how can, you, how can you actually change this or reduce this? Now, in terms of, I think it's, there's no immediate solution. I think it's going to, in, in the sense that, because it's so it's a cultural event that people look to and look forward to that we now have to consider how we can change attitudes and behavior to the use of fireworks so maybe at the moment individuals can use fireworks in their home maybe in the future we'd have to change attitudes to say there will only be uh, one special event and you're not allowed to use fireworks or you can you ban the use of certain fireworks. So I don't think there's an immediate solution because if you said tomorrow, right, no fireworks are allowed, then I think people will will not accept that because it's part of the custom, part of the tradition. So I think this is probably a, a kind of more of a long-term uh, campaign required to show people that actually fireworks, you no know, fireworks is not is bad for the air that we breathe and has an impact on human health. So I would say it's, a, it's more of a medium to long term issue. We need to change attitudes and behavior and ultimately take action in terms of maybe uh, banning certain types of fireworks for individual use and then only having organized uh, firework displays, which I know causes many problems and it's not that easy. Do we have any additional questions before we move on to the next topic? So well, if there, really, yeah, is there another question? No, no, I just read the, it's the same it's the same issue. So yeah, I uh, yeah, I have nothing to add to that. Okay. So only if, yeah, I can actually actually I do have something to add because um of one your brief life campaign could be a vehicle to uh, raise awareness of this issue that may change attitudes to the way we use fireworks in uh, you know festivities. So this could be one way getting involved in the Breathe Life campaign. That's a very good idea. So before moving on to Marike, who will give us seven examples, I wanted to, to just show you a, a few seconds of, of the teaser for, for this campaign. So it's on now.
So thank you for taking those uh, 90 seconds to look at this. So let me introduce to you Maritia Hansparen. She's the manager of Equity's Low Carbon Cities program and director of the Mon Center for Local Climate Action and Reporting. Uh, we have a lot of background noise. Uh, I don't know if somebody can put on mute. Uh, what if? In my, somebody is stopping gardening outside. Ah, just a moment. Oh, I see. Okay, <laughs> sorry. Thanks. Yeah, that was the city of Bonn that probably contributed to some of the pollution levels as well. Uh, uh, so Marike is an international political analyst with 25 years experience. Um, she leads in place policy and technical support for local governments around the globe on low emission development, helping cities of all sizes achieve results such as improved air quality, local job creation, effectively reducing greenhouse gas emissions and local pollutants. She supports the organization Global Climate Advocacy at the UNFCCC. So Marike, over to you, and we are back in Bonn, uh, noise and warm Bonn. Thank you very much, Helena. Thank you also, Gary, for a very introduction, useful introduction to see where the problems are and what we could do. I'm going to specifically focus on the role of cities or local governments in achieving air and climate co-benefits. Um, if you see the picture in front of you, that is the lovely city of Seoul, and there uh, they, ex they also have extreme challenges in air quality which is also caused by, by the sandstorms in the region, in addition to the uh, climate pollution uh, and the challenges we have with short-lived climate pollutants. Uh, very briefly introducing my organization, uh, we're PICLE, Local Governments for Sustainability, is a global city, town and region network, and we work with 1,500 uh, of them in 108 countries. And our focus is sustainable development. So we work on climate issues, but also the SDGs. Uh, we were created in 1990 and focus on all the topics that local and subnational governments uh, are exploring, in particular under relevant to this context, low carbon resilience, eco-mobility, resource efficiency, biodiversity, and health, amongst others. We provide policy uh, and technical guidance, as well as tools peer learning and networking opportunities. And at the moment, we impact about 25% of the global urban population through our work. We focus very much on policy or political issues as well as technical issues. So looking at processes and systems from the government side on how we could improve those. Um, give, we offer platforms and advocacy, for example, representing the local and subnationals at the UNFCCC and the climate debate. Now, Gary very briefly already touched on, on emissions. Specifically, I wish to zoom in on the short-lived climate pollutants, which is a terminology used mostly in, in this sphere, not typically by local governments, but more uh, on the science side, and there's a need for much better understanding what this means. But essentially, if you look at it from a city perspective, these would be air pollutants, pollution uh, and emissions that are dealt with, um, including then the normal greenhouse gas emissions, but then added on those SLCPs in addition. So urban sources of SLCPs, Gary already touched on as well, the industries, commercial and residential um, heating and electricity, and fuel power transportation, as well as open burning um, are huge problems in a number of countries. And we recommend that the cities look into this from their own perspective, because it does vary um, and normally would look, they would look at this from a sectoral perspective. Now, what, one of the things that is typically not yet happening widely is addressing both greenhouse gas emissions and climate action, as well as air pollution together when dealing with climate action planning. And there we recommend following an integrated approach, considering there are very limited resources normally at the local government level, um, limited budget, limited staff. So one can do a lot together addressing these when you plan, when you implement, and when you monitor. An example, we supported the city of Bogor in Indonesia to develop the greenhouse gas emissions um, inventory, which was developed for the 2010, with 2010 data. And if you look at the sources here, industrial processes, wastewater, open burning of waste, these are also linked to the air quality dimension. So one can, through emissions inventories, clearly define where are the problem zones, 
and then also from that project, where are we going to go over a period of time, in this case to 2020, following the business as usual pattern. And based on this information, we can design a very useful, clearly um, developed local climate action plan addressing also air quality to reduce these emissions in the challenging sectors. Now we know it's not easy to do, and in that sense we also support cities uh, to understand what their options are. And we have in particular um, understanding that they struggle at finding access to finance. We've launched the TAP program, the Transformative Actions program, as a call for projects that address climate and air, and air quality issues. And an example I'm showing you now is the city of Rajput in India. They have proposed a zero waste society. This is extremely interesting because waste, as you may know, in India is a major challenge, but it's also a great resource. And the Rajkot Municipal Corporation, in partnership with local societies and other private players um, who would be involved in the operation and the maintenance of the system, have conceptualized the spread zero waste society idea. It's linked to the Smart Housing Society scheme to focus on developing low carbon, zero waste communities. And they wish to do this through decentralized integrated solutions looking at both solid and liquid waste. Again, waste as a great resource and waste, tackling waste in a way to reduce the pollution efforts. Now they've selected their, their societies with whom they wish to work with um, and have kind of concluded their pre-feasibility study and are exploring their funding options. Uh, the local government itself is contributing some financing, but to do things at scale they obviously need additional funds and additional investors. Hopping to another country, to Mongolia. Ulaanbaatar is an interesting example. If you look at the way people live there, this is a capital city with a population over a million and huge problems caused uh, in terms of air pollution from coal burning to heat and cook during the winter. Uh, I've not been to Ulaanbaatar, but I understand that it's very fascinating also to observe um, people, the city residents living in the chair areas, 60% of them in, tra in these traditional tents with no access to public services. So they need to burn um, wood and whatever they can find to heat and, and, and cook. Um, this is normal human behavior. And now the question is how can we support them to switch to using more efficient stoves, more efficient cooking methods, more efficient heating methods in a tent context, not easy to do. So also needing a need to look at the building sector and how one could provide more efficient buildings. If you look at the temperature range in that, in that particular city, it's extensive. So that also causes, uh, is part of the challenge, quite frankly, when one deals with heating um, in a, and cooling in a society where your, your systems and procedures are not yet in place. So Ulaanbaatar has joined the East Asia Clean Air Cities project, uh, which we have to get financed and embedded in the Climate and Clean Air Coalition, uh, bringing together a number of capitals from the region to also actively and practically work on the topic, looking at policies and the tools that they can use uh, to switch and um, definitely tackle their air quality much more efficiently. Coming to the Global North, also here, quality and air quality is, is a major challenge. The city of Freiburg in Germany has, has done an excellent work um, through the Procura Plus campaign, looking, for, looking at it from a sustainable procurement perspective. They've considered buses that would meet stricter emission standards, and the entire fleet of the Freiburg Transport Utility now meets the minimum Euro 5 standard. So this is for light passengers and commercial vehicles. The buses offer, operate on sulfur-free diesel. They're equipped with modern filter systems so to capture those particulates. And if you look at the reductions that were achieved, this is what we wish to see in the cities. This is also an option, for example, for the Indian challenge that is listed. Um, switching to clean fuels, more efficient public transport, where you can tackle your monoxide, your non-methane hydrocarbons, your nitrogen oxides, as well as your particulate matter. One of the areas that where we guide local governments is through the Eco-Mobility World Festivals. This is essentially to take an area in a city, or the old city, 
and explore how to switch from polluting ways of transport to systems and that improve quality of life, that offer new opportunities for business in cities, but then specifically um, look at transport and mobility solutions, which would include walking, uh, pedestrian zones, cycling zones, but also very interesting dimension uh, in Suwon they explored, uh, have, they've closed down a whole complete section in the city and completely changed the way transport and mobility is being addressed and they've removed over 1,500 cities uh, cars from the city centre. This was a very interesting model. When the festival stopped, the citizens then decided how they would continue in this having had an interesting experience learning from how their lives could change if the transport mobility systems were changing. This was done um, also in Johannesburg and the next one would be in Kaohsiung in Chinese Taipei, so watch that space because this is an interesting area where it's really a living lab context that one can use for switching uh, and improving air, uh, air quality. Mexico City, as you might know, is also struggling with pollution and um, they've tried now with a bike sharing scheme and have effectively reduced carbon dioxide uh, over a process of five years. Uh, also in looking interesting that the, the share of women riding bikes has increased so it also has a nice gender dimension. These are the things that are, they look like small activities but if you cluster them, you bring biking, you bring public mobility, uh, you bring cleaner cook stoves, all of these things together uh, one can make a huge dent um, in the uh, harmful emissions in the city centre. We are capturing these through voluntary reporting on the Carbon Climate Registry. This is a platform made for specifically local and subnational governments to report voluntarily to make sure that they move towards MRV, measuring, reporting and verifying. It supports also the vertical integration of other levels <coughs> of government and also working together in a particular region, so horizontal cooperation and aggregation. The registry is also rolling out now to tackle um, the reporting on air quality uh, through the CCNC, and we look at and try to capture also not only the benefits of specific action, but also the co-benefits to understand how we can build better arguments to mobilize many more city and national, national and local and regional governments to work together on this. It is interesting to observe the level of ambition of commitments and targets is definitely increasing and also we see the performance that is being measured, so the greenhouse gas emissions and short-lived climate pollutants that are being tracked. Um, there's, there's great robust data being collected and the diversity of actions that are being reported on really show the leadership um, of our local and subnational leaders um, as well as the technical colleagues of course. So we like to use this Carbon Climate Registry to share information, show good practice and start with a benchmarking um, opportunity for cities next year. An example of the co-benefits we capture, this is a, um, a spider graph you see with mitigation and adaptation actions showing the different kinds of co-benefits and if you definitely look at the mitigation side, so the yellow line, urban air quality, urban life livelihood, safe and resilient energy supply, green urban economy, these are the highlights and public health are clearly uh, one of the highly reported elements as well. This is the kind of information we need more robust reporting on to be able to capture and identify where things do not work so well. So we offer a very clear package of support for our local governments from process guidance through the Green Climate Cities program to guidance on how to do inventories that are clearly standardized and obviously the air quality dimension needs to still be added to that. Although we do address carbon dioxide um, as well as methane in the GPC, um, but there's certainly more work to be done to include um, black carbon um, and our particular matter, how we would capture this the kind of information in a standardized way is still under discussion. We offer inventory tools that can be used we offer the registry and we are offering the TAP project pipeline to also make sure that the quality of projects that would become implemented by the implementation projects are solid, robust and can easily access finance. Coming back very briefly to the role 
of local and subnational governments. They've got a host of areas that they can use to plan, to regulate, and to act. This from a strategy, making sure that there's a vision for the community, and one can split that down into the community, but also for the governmental operations, where one can show leadership by switching to clean buses, clean fuels, your own operation as a government, you own and manage infrastructure, for example, roads, or tramways, or metro systems. All of these one can use to switch to clean, climate-friendly approaches. Legal opportunities, the laws, the bylaws, the regulations. With permitting, you can block action, negative action, and you can encourage uh, positive activities in this space. So, so the carrot uh, and stick approach is embedded in a lot of this thinking. Obviously, urban and spatial planning um, is in the hands of the government, and that can help make sure that airflow through the system, for example, can be dealt with by not building uh, or allowing buildings uh, to block airflow in, in corridors where you know you can blow away the dirty air and make sure that there is an incoming flow of fresh air. You can look at financial issues, market issues. Green public procurement should not be underestimated. That is most definitely a winner for the leaders that we work with. And the leadership and the role model of a local government should not be underestimated. Uh, Helena already addressed the Breathe Life campaign. This is an amazing tool uh, with great resources that can be used by any local or subnational government. They can also make it their own uh, by bringing in their own logos and making real use of this to inform people on the options available. In summary, we know local and subnationals are keen to reduce emissions and tackle air pollutions. Wide range of benefits are there and becoming clearer as we get more information on those. And also non-action implies a lack of leadership, so there's a political message in there. The NDCs, the Nationally Determined Contributions, as part of the Paris Agreement, will only be achievable if we include and involve the local and subnational governments. But here we still need better coordination and communication to raise the level of ambition together. We know we have a huge emissions gap from the current commitments, if you look at, at, the, at the aggregated commitments. So there's much to be done. And we need, in this sense, supportive frameworks from the national level, including access to better finance, to ease the process, and to make sure we can scale. We know there is a win-win opportunity in this space. And we definitely hope to raise the partnership between national and local governments to move forward faster, more effectively, to address issues such as the air quality uh, problems that were listed in the questions in India. Thank you very much. Over to you, Helena. Thank you, Marike. We have now 12 minutes left of our time. Uh, we end uh, in 12 minutes at 11 o'clock our time in Paris. We have a couple of questions, and I would like to ask both Gary and Marike to be on hold to be able to answer these questions. And also, if anybody else have others, uh, please just uh, uh, add them. So we already asked about India and the firecrackers. There is another question from Indra, India from Chihari, Manohoran. Uh, and he says that most of the metro cities have PM more than 180, which is harmful to read. And what can help us is reduce at least below 100. And that is remembering that the, the, the guidelines of the lowest that show is actually 10. There is another one. Uh, do you want to also give any general comments on that, either Marike or Gary? There is, there is another one from Delhi. Maybe I can just add the other one from Delhi, just so you have the two India ones. It's from Patwi from New Delhi, India. And he says, considering the current state of Delhi with the air quality index meandering at nine, uh, between 999 and 500, and given that the Indian government has no air quality index for indoor air, how useful are air purifiers for household usage at this point of time? And overall, what are the steps that individuals can take to minimize risks? So over to first Marike, and then maybe Gary can say two words. Marike. Uh, thank you, Elena. I think there are two dimensions to this. So on the one hand, Individuals can do a lot, but it also depends whether one has 
a little bit of money or a lot of money or what we could do. So I would tend to focus rather on the framework conditions which are needed to be put in place by national governments. They need to take the responsibility and the leadership um, to deal with these issues at the macro level. If the policies are in place, step by step, things will change. The technologies will be cleaner and more efficient. The fuels will be cleaner and more efficient. And one could move step by step to um, offer to also the poorer section of the community uh, affordable technologies, for example, clean cook stoves and so on, to directly tackle pollution in their particular places. Um, it's, it's, if you look at the same with air conditioning, with the situation we had, um, the climate is increasing, People, a lot of people put on individual air conditioners, but if they were a clever solution, one could rather use a district energy system that cools, which would be more efficient and also more fuel saving. With the air, air cleaning systems, this is, I guess, a different situation. Uh, also with the people who have breathing problems, definitely need this kind of technology in their homes, in their workspace. Um, but again, I, I wish to stress, we need the national guidance, the national policies, policies uh, and the leadership at that level, which would help make a bigger faster transition in the country. Gary, would you like to add a few words? Um, I think with the first question you mentioned about uh, PM under an 80 uh, in uh, metro cities, I think the key, the key issue um, with any form of air pollution is to understand where is it, where is, what is the main source of that pollu uh, pollution and un understanding, you know, <clears throat> whether it's uh, traffic or it's open burning or whether it's uh, sandstorms. And um, first of all, so we need to understand, it, you know, where, what is the source of the particulate matter and then we need to take the appropriate action to address that. So if it's from vehicles, it could be requiring new new technologies, better fuel quality, better car maintenance. If it's from um, open burning, then it's again changing behaviors and attitudes to ban this kind of kind of behavior. And so I think the first question is, if uh, your if any type of air uh, pollution or air pollutant is higher, then the first question to ask, where what is the source of that? And we need to understand. Uh, you know where it's coming from, and that's by monitoring and looking at emission inventories. So before we can take the appropriate action, so that's my the first answer. I think um, again with the indoor air pollution, someone asked about air purifiers. Um, I think they can be useful, but I don't know the the exact evidence how effective they are. You know, in, in re improving the indoor air quality, I don't know about that. But ultimately, it's about Again, uh, changing if if the indoor air pollution is because of you know the way we cook food or because of certain kind of um, household products that causes uh, has certain uh, emissions. I think ultimately, when it comes to air pollution and individual exposure, we can reduce the sources of air pollution, but equally we've got to change our, each we've got to change our behaviour. So I think at the centre of uh, urban air pollution is what we do as individuals, changing our attitudes and changing our behavior, how we travel, how we cook, how we deal with things and our expectations. So it's important to have the measures, but we also need to you know, contribute to being part of the solution as individuals. So that basically means uh, don't burn your waste if you can avoid it. Uh, separate biodegradable stuff that we turn into biogas even, if you can. Make sure you have the cleanest possible cooking or heating facility at home if you can choose. Don't choose the one burning biomass. If you have to burn biomass, try to use filters or, or different ways of avoiding the, the smoke. So this is basically, and, and, and don't put it on all day. Use it only when you really need to cook or, or heat. So it's many things like this. I, I guess we should probably, in the Breed Light campaign, uh, maybe do a little bit of a, what can you do it, do it yourself, and how can the individuals help governments take decisions? What's the kind of uh, demands from from the population that are targeted enough to, to help and enable change to happen? Because sometimes there are also governments who take 
stringent air pollution control measures, and they have very big uh, population disagreement, let's say, because it touches upon areas where, where, where people require to be able to, to act. So it goes hand in hand also with demand and what they offer on, on the market to be able to change. If we talk about cooking or heating or cars. There is another question regarding the cars from Africa. There are two, there are two questions, so I think they were both to Gary, but maybe the second one can also be from Eric here. I'll take, give you the two questions so we move on before we close. Hi Gary, in your map of state of ambient air quality, is there a danger to inactivity due to sparse data in African cities? i give you the second question as well, so you can answer both if you want. This is about both Asia and Africa. Currently, there is a great market for second-hand Asian cars being sold to African nations. These cars are clearly outdated in their pollution emitting levels. Would a ban on this not be a measure we can take? Is there any in place? This would make African nations invest in a futuristic transportation net at once rather than give out double or more than the amount they will need to when they find out that their air quality is tremendously poor. Over to Gary first. I think I, I, I wrote something there as an answer to that question uh, about Africa. So I think the lack of air quality, air quality data in any city should not be an excuse for inaction. There are a number of uh, basic techniques that can be used such as rapid emission inventories to understand where the pollution is. But I guess we all know the very simplest thing is the visual the visual effect of air pollution, we can see it, we, we know, doesn't necessarily mean that what we, what we perceive as air pollution will affect us, but we visually we can see if uh, a bus or a car is pumping out black smoke. That's the most basic thing that you understand that maybe if you see lots of you have a basic problem. So what I'm saying is air quality data should not, the lack of air quality data should not be an excuse for inaction, that there are a few low cost um, rapid techniques to get an understanding of the situation and again there's probably a few um, once we understand where the pollution is coming from there's probably a number of uh, measures we can take which again are low cost um, and simple so uh, the WHO in that map they actually modeled uh, the, uh, the exposure of air quality in the city so from an international level or national level you can do modeling to, to understand the exposure, but no, I don't think uh, lack of data should be uh, an excuse. And there are ways and means. Ultimately, it's about having the political will to do it, but also about having, especially in certain countries where there, there's multiple uh, objectives and multiple issues, is to have the policymakers aware of the issue. And I guess, you know, what uh, Breathe Life campaign is doing is trying to raise that awareness in order to not just for residents, but also for policymakers to realize that air pollution is an issue and needs to be addressed. There's a follow-up question here. How useful are real-time air pollution monitoring apps like Air Visual App? I would think that that raises awareness as well. That's over to you, Gary. Yeah, I, I think, um, again, we need to look at the accuracy. There's two aspects to this. You know, if you want pure scientific accuracy, it depends on, it all depends on where the data comes from, it, the quality of that data, whether that data is being, you know, is, is, is done in a way that is quality assured and quality controlled. So um, it's from, you can look at two perspectives, from a kind of awareness raising perspective, if the margin of error in that data is you know, is small, or they have a very effective system on which the base, the uh, the um, that app is is based on the data. Then it's really useful for awareness. Right? It's do, nobody, um, I guess, a, an individual is is not concerned about how accurate it is as long as they get an no, idea of whether it's uh, um, it's going to affect, you know, they're going to impact on their health. So I think they're useful in raising awareness, um, but also we need to, we we should always think about you know. When we, especially when we compare cities, and this was an issue when we saw um, recently with WHO um, okay. uh, information about which cities are the most polluted. It's very difficult to compare cities because they don't all have the same kind of monitoring 
um, and quality control. So I think they're useful for, for awareness raising, but also in terms of accuracy, I would need to know the individual app. And I, my question would be, where do they get that data from? And is that data quality assured and quality control? Okay, we have to close now because we are yeah. coming to an hour. It has been really rich. I have many more questions coming in just as we almost close. I will uh, ask all of you who participate to come back to us next uh, uh, next seminar. Webinar is going to be on the 23rd of November, same time. And it will focus again with Gary back on, on more details on the emission reduction strategies and the roadmap from Clean Air Asia, Glinda, will talk to us about uh, how to measure and achieve air quality uh, change. And then we have a third one on Wednesday the 7th, where we will have the World Health Organization with us and hear from from uh, Santiago of Chile, a very concrete, specific example of what they've done. I would like to encourage all of you who have made questions to come back then. We are collecting all the questions, and we will try to answer individually if we can, but we will definitely use your questions also to, to, to target the next presentations, especially with Gary. For example, we have questions about from Pakistan on, on transboundary issues and how city governments can tackle this. We have a question from Meg in Cebu City talking about 70% of air pollution from mobile sources and asking about uh, narrowing roads, if that will help. And there are a few other questions regarding to mobility as well. So thank you to our speakers, thank you to our participants, and we look forward to a continued dialogue. This uh, webinars will be put up online, and we will try to be able to also attach to that some questions and answers in writing that you can go back to and, and add to as well as users and practitioners from your cities. See you next time on the 23rd of November in this webinar series. Thank you and goodbye.